All right, so one, two, three. Hi folks, Thomas Henson here with another episode of Big Data, Big Questions. Still jumping in that interview section where we're going through careers. Today, another amazing guest. Folks may know this person as the Dean of Big Data, but Bill Schmarzo. If you've been following my channel for a while, I've done a book review. And if you've been following me and you're at DataWorks Summit, I think it was 20, 2017? Uh, Bill's on stage. I had a breakout session, um, a lot of good stuff. So we talk about that, uh, bring up some old memories, talk about uh, when we actually used to work together, um, and then talk about his newest book. So we'll, we'll dive into his newest book. And let me just tell you, this, this episode, make sure you tune in. He's going to talk about what he thinks about data science versus data engineering and the career output for those uh, there at the end. I didn't plan that. It's not that I'm trying to make you know a teaser, so you have to tune in, which, which you should tune in the whole time. And then second off, if you're interested in any kind of career, and maybe you're like, hey, you know what? I'm ready to move on to the next stage in my career, or I want to get you know in the C levels, or you know I want to be maybe less technical but more you know business driven. Listen to this episode where he talks about you know career outlook for the chief data officer. You know his thoughts around that that vision. What companies are doing it well? How many companies aren't? So, uh, so many different nuggets that you can take from this. Make sure that you tune in. And then also my my request to to everybody watching is one, put in the comment section here below what you think about these interviews. Second off, send me your ideas for who should be on. Maybe it's you, maybe you wanna come on uh, for the interview series. Reach out to me, right? Put it in the comment section here. And if you haven't been tuned in and if this is your first time, um, this channel, you know, all about data analytics, um, but also about careers in IT and tech, right? So that's what some of these interviews are because data is actually touching all those. I mean, we've had interviews on about marketing. So I will stop talking so we can get into this amazing interview. All right, so one, two, three. Hi, folks. Thanks for joining today. We are excited, super excited. We have Bill Schmarzo on today. Bill, say hi to the Big Data, Big Questions audience. Hey, Thomas, and hi, Big Question, Big Data, Big Question audience. Glad to be here. Man, so I think the last time I saw you in person, uh, we were on stage back when they used to have these things called conferences that you went to. And I think you were, you were coming off stage, you did a five minute, you did a little air guitar uh, back. I, I think we had, it was Hortonworks. I think it was the Hortonworks uh, Conference Data Summit, something like that. So yep, yep. how you been? I've been doing well. I've been keeping busy and in trouble, which is what you're supposed to do, right? Right. Yeah, no, it's good, <laughs> man. So um, folks in the audience, if, if you've been following the channel for a long time, I actually did a review on um, Bill's, I think this was your second book, Bill. So the Big yes, Data was. MBA. Um, so Bill's got a new book out, but Bill, for the folks who haven't watched that amazing video or haven't heard of you, why don't you give us an intro? Tell, tell us who you are, what you do, and a little bit of your background. Sure. So um, background wise, probably 40 some years in the data and analytics space. Um, lots of Forrest Gump moments in my life, you know, right place, right time. Not because I'm tall or good looking or from Iowa. Sometimes you just get lucky to be in the right place. So in the late 1980s, I was there at running a project with Procter & Gamble and Walmart that ended up being sort of the very first data warehouse BI project. Spent 25 years in the BI data warehouse space when I was then recruited away from business objects by Yahoo to head up and be their vice president of advertiser analytics. That was at the time that Yahoo was developing this technology called Hadoop. <laughs> and so um, I made the transition from a BI person to a you know data scientist. I teach at the University of San Francisco where I'm an um, executive fellow. I also teach at the National University of Ireland in Galway where I'm an honorary professor. Um, you know, and currently in between gigs, I uh, just left my last gig where I was the chief innovation officer, which was a most excellent adventure. Um, it opened up all kinds of new domains and experiences, a lot of which I captured in my new book. Things that just, you know, things I hadn't thought about before that just all of a sudden became realized um, what was important. And in Thomas, part of that realization was on the AI ML side, what yeah. we could do from an from an economics perspective, but also the power of team, the, the power of empowering teams and how these go together. So Bill, I, I wanna jump right into this because you and I talked a little bit uh, before this and we've talked in the past and it, you know, 
I think for my audience, we talk a ton about the technical and those are a lot of the questions that I get, but there's so much power in, in, in understanding the business side. So first right in, you talk about the chief data officer for my audience or for anybody, what, do, I mean, what does a chief data officer do? Like what is, what, what is the CDO role? Yeah. So I, I think the chief data officer for most organization has become a mini me CIO. And what I mean by that is I think the role of the chief data officer in most organizations is not very fun or creative or provocative. And I'm on a mission to actually change the nature of that role. I want that role to become the chief data monetization officer because I believe that organizations need to have a senior executive whose single focus is figuring out how do I get value out of my data? Um, so this chief data, so I'm on this crusade trying to get organizations to realize that, that the, the, there's, there's all kinds of unique economic value associated with data and analytics. And, and the chief data monetization officer probably doesn't and shouldn't have a technology background. I'm going to argue their background should be economics. Because you think about what economics is about, economics is about the creation of wealth and value and how you use assets to create value. Well. That's what, that's what data is all about. And you use analytics to convert raw data into valuable, actionable customer product and operational insights that you can use to derive and drive new sources of value. So, so Thomas, my mission has been the chief data officer, you look like a CIO kind of person, you don't want that person. I want a chief data monetization officer who lives and breathes, who wakes up every morning and says, my job is to figure out how to get value out of that data. And it's charted with, with integrating across the entire organization, not just within IT, but with sales and marketing and operations and engineering and everybody else to figure out where and how can we use data to drive new sources of value. No, I like that. So um, in this, in, in, I, I'm going to dig into this in a couple different ways, but first, all right. All right so in that role, so um, you, 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 you get to decide this. So who does that person report to now? Uh, well, well, who does that report to report to now? And where do you think that structure should be in the organization in Bill's, Bill's most excellent adventure for, for, for your organization? Now, Bill's most excellent venture. <laughs> it's a great. So I think this role should report to the CEO. See, now, I said, right, right away, people are, oh, CEO, that's your schmarzo. Why don't you just, why don't you just make them the CEO <laughs> themselves, right? Well, I would do that, but I don't want to get bogged down with all the crap that goes on with dealing with stockholders. No, th this is a role that needs to sit at a level where this person can easily step across the organizational boundaries and can help organizations to leverage and exploit, reuse, share, refine these data and analytic assets. If they're buried underneath IT, they'll never get anywhere because no one takes IT seriously from a business perspective. If you stick them in finance or marketing or someplace, then you've automatically put them into a box. And this is the problem with most organizations. We tend to want to put people in boxes. And once you're in a box, it's like a friggin' cage, right? You can't get out of it. This person needs to have the authority to be able to walk across and show sales, marketing, finance, product management, engineering, how this one data source, for example, can power some of their key use cases and can drive that collaboration across the different business units so that they all can share and reuse the same data, data sets over and over again. So in Schmarzo's most excellent adventure, this person reports high in the organization and is chartered with driving the overall across the organization use and monetization of these very valuable and economic or economically unique data and analytic assets. Let's, we, let's drill into this for a second. I mean, uh, <laughs> no, this, go, go ahead. And, go, go this ahead. is why this is such an important conversation. This is why I think that this, the person who runs this role needs to have more of an economics background than a technology background. Here's the reason why <clears throat> data as an economic asset, never wears out, never depletes, and the same data set can be used across an unlimited number of use cases at a marginal cost equal to zero. Now think about that. Marginal cost equal to zero. I have this asset. I can use it over and over and over and over again. It never wears out. It isn't, data is not the new oil. No, data is like the new sun. It never goes away. It's always providing energy for us. And so first off, from a data perspective, the thing that destroys and hinders the economic value of data are data silos. If you can't share data, 
across the organization, I can't take advantage of that economic multiplier effect, right? I can use that data over and over again at a marginal cost equal to zero. So that's number one is that data from an economics perspective is unlike any other asset we've ever seen in our life. And we, we, we tend to treat it like, like it's, we use an accounting mindset to try to put it into a box. No, don't put it in a box, no boxes. We want swirls and let this thing swirl across the organization driving the value. Now here's part two. So while data has this very unique asset that can be used over and over again, analytics is engineered correctly, will actually get more valuable the more that they are used. Right? Think about an asset you could have, maybe it's a car, maybe a Tesla, and I love Elon Musk. When he made this statement, he made this provocative statement, which most people still don't understand what he was meaning by this. He says, he said, I believe that when you buy a Tesla, you are buying an asset that appreciates in value, not depreciates. Now, all the accounting people go, well, what, what the hell does that mean? Assets, you depreciate assets, you take them, you write them off. Yeah, real estate, 27, year, 27 and a half years over, over time, right? Yeah, yeah. And he's saying, nope, wrong model, wrong frame. You've already lost the game. You're thinking the wrong way about it. He's saying, no, I can build an asset by the use of AI. And across a million Tesla cars, these cars are continuously learning. Every time they turn a corner, every time they go past the passenger, every time they go down the road, they're continuously learning. And every night, the learning from each one of those million cars gets sucked up to the Tesla cloud in the sky and gets aggregated and then back propagated back to every car. So anything that one car learns about a particular driving situation, now each of those million cars have learned it as well. That's, that's amazing. You can build these autonomous assets that continue to continuously learn and adapt. And many times this learning and adapting occurs with very minimal human intervention. So this is why your chief data monetization officer isn't necessarily need to have a technology background, but needs to have an economics background and figuring out how, how, does, how do I leverage that? How do I use that to reinvent my business models? How do I use that to disintermediate customer relationships? How do I use that to totally redesign not just my business model, but the entire industries, disrupt the entire industry business model? I love it. So today, right? I, 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 I love the passion. You gave me like five questions that I just wrote down that, 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 that I've got to follow up with. Uh, you, put, see, but, you put a nickel in me and you got me going. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> but so today, right? So it's in today, we're not in Bill's excellent adventure today. And that's, that's why we're here today to talk, hopefully, you know, to, to change that culture. So typically, the CDO will, re will report to the CIO. And is that where we get challenges where it yeah. becomes an IT function? So marketing may be prohibitive, because they're like, I don't want to, I don't want to deal with the, with, with the CIO's organization or engineering is like, we have our own kind of functionality. So it's, it's more of a political or, you know, just a, just organizational Bingo. structure. Bingo. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, the, the CIO, um, the IT organization has always been a cost center, not a profit center. And so the mindset around IT has never been, how do I leverage that organization to derive new sources of value? Um, so you, when you put the CDO or the chief data monetization officer into that spot, I mean, they don't look like the CIO at all. Nothing they do looks like what the yeah. CIO does. But yet we've got this, this mini me CIO stuck in the CDO role and they, and they think their job is to manage data. You're, no, your job is not to friggin' manage data. Your job is to friggin' monetize it. So there's, there's a total mind shift that needs to take place. Now, I'll tell you right now, Thomas, there's only a handful of companies out there that get this. Yeah. But, but, you know, if you look at the stock market, you look at the top five or six highest valuable companies out there, and you look at the amount of goodwill that's stuck in those companies, it comes from this monitor. You can very quickly figure out who these companies are who have cracked the code and are going, this is great. This leveraging data and analytics to drive my business case use cases is like printing money. And if no one else figures it out, that's too bad. I just keep growing and getting more powerful. Yeah. So that was one of my questions is how many companies are doing it right. So for those, like you've got me thinking here now. So if, if, you know, for those companies that are doing it right and your CDO and, you know, I, just my head goes straight to career, to career path. And, and before I ask some of the questions about, 
you know, what do we think a, a good CDO is? The way that you're explaining it to me is if 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 I were and I, I please I do not want to be a CEO anybody so don't <laughs> don't, don't yeah. take me wrong but but you're what you're saying and, and the way that you're kind of painting it to me like as you know as an investor or as a board member if I were looking at the next mm -hmm. uh, next CEO I would want somebody maybe that came from one of those organizations that that could be a natural step for a CDO or our chief data monetization officer similar to you see it so much for so long. Um, where you see you see CFOs being be moving into the CEO role, uh, is is it fair to make the statement that those oh, CEOs I, I, could go to CEO? I think you look at, I mean, probably the chief, the best chief data monetization officer out there is Elon Musk, yeah, right. And you know, places like Google, they, they, these, uh, you know, Amazon, masters of this, you know, Apple, um, you know, Microsoft, and parts of their business, not all of them, but parts of their business. These companies realize that they are in, not just in the data business, they're in the data monetization business and they've cracked the code. I mean, think about for a second about Google, TensorFlow, right? We were just joking earlier about TensorFlow, right? Yeah, exactly. The, the single most important technology that Google has and they open source it. Now, 99.99% of the financial analysts out there are going, what the heck? Why would you ever open source your most valuable technology? And here's the reason why, in my humble opinion, why Google did it. It's because in knowledge-based industries, the economies of learning are more powerful than the economies of scale. So by having everybody out there using TensorFlow across a wide variety of use cases, TensorFlow just gets smarter and smarter and smarter. And who is the best at leveraging TensorFlow to drive data monetization? Google. So all their competitors who are using their product are just helping Google to print more money. No, I like, I, I love that. And it's, it's, I, I totally agree. And, and you've almost stole my uh, sales pitch or training pitch that I give to people. The, the, the emphasis I put on it too, is you and I know, you and I know what they, what, what Google uses, right? They use TensorFlow. They, they, they've open sourced it and it's a, it's a great product. Even if you and I were the most proficient um, TensorFlow people on the planet and we didn't work for Google, we don't have the data stores that Google have. Right. Right. And, and, and so they're, you know, they're, they're able to get, they're able to make their product better. Kind of like what you were saying with Tesla, make your product better, but you don't have the data elements to, to, to act upon it. And they, they have the data sources, but they also have a different mindset. Their, their data scientists are not like normal data scientists. They give them a level of training that I don't think the average data scientist ever would, under, would ever appreciate and understand. I mean, most of their senior data scientists at Google are taught design thinking. Now you're gonna think design thinking, that has nothing to do with building you know, neural networks or anything. I said, and you know, I guess, right, it's true, right? It's, they, they understand in detail what it is they're trying to do first and then figure out what data they need. Not figure out, not to say, oh, here's what data I have, so what problems can I solve? No, how do you distinguish signal from noise if you don't know the problem you're trying to solve? And I think what you see from Google, at least in the folks I've met there, and I've not met a lot, but the ones I've met have been pretty impressive. They've got a laser focus on, on trying to figure out what is it we're trying to do? And then what data do we need to support that? They've reversed the process. Everybody thinks about, oh, I'm just gonna gather a bunch of data and then here, tell me what's valuable in data. Well, I mean, again, how do you distinguish signal from noise in the data if you don't know what you're trying to do? So they've taken it and yeah, they got brilliant tools and they got great data sets, but they have a different mindset. It's kind of like what Elon Musk did. He's got this whole, I mean, if you want to change the game, change your frame, look at something different than your competition does. Look at it differently than your competition. And you've got a chance of providing some very unique, differentiated, compelling value. No, I think that's important. And one of the things that, you know, I, I come more from the software side um, as a software engineer. And, you know, we, we say this all the time, but we, we don't act upon it. I don't even act upon it sometimes, right? Like we, we think first and foremost, what is the new framework I can use versus what is the right framework for the job? Same thing in data, right? Just, just flipping, what do we want to solve? And let's go find the data elements to, to, to solve that. So I'm going to give a homework assignment to, to your uh, listeners and I'll provide the link for it. We developed a tool, design thinking tool 
called the Hypothesis Development Canvas. And what it does is it articulates the problem we're trying to solve before we ever put science to the data. So what problem are you trying to solve? What are the metrics and KPIs against which you're going to measure success and progress? Who are the key stakeholders you need to buy in? What are the asset models you need to put in place? What are the decisions you're trying to drive? The predictions support that? The, what data sources, what you might need? And even, even probably the most important part is what are the costs of the false positives and false negatives? If you don't know the cost of the false positives and false negatives, you never know if your model is good enough. But yet we sort of let that kind of flutter through. So we build this hypothesis development canvas. We do it through an envisioning exercise. You probably remember me talking about envisioning exercises back in the day. I still do those. They are still invaluable in driving alignment across the organization to figure out what problem we're trying to solve. We put all that into the hypothesis development canvas. Now the data science team knows what they're trying to do. They know how they're going to measure success and progress. They know what decisions the customers are trying to make. They know what predictions they need to go. They now have a, a framework for figuring out which of the thousands of the different data sources are probably most important in solving that. Yeah, no, I, I like that. And we'll definitely make sure we link it here uh, in the description uh, and in the show notes. So I'll make sure that we, we post that. So I want to, I, I want to go back. I think we've set the stage and you know, the way, the way I'm here in this conversation today, I'm pretty excited about it that, hey, there's a career path for folks that like data that could possibly be CTO. Now this is Thomas and Bill saying that, but I think we have a pretty good, uh, a, 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 a pretty good handle on it. So it may, it may not work out, but what would you say to somebody who's, maybe they're in college watching this, maybe they're just wanting to change careers or even, you know, we even have some folks who are, who are at just, just moving into college. Um, hey, this sounds interesting. I like the business side. Um, I can be a peacemaker. What, how do I become a CDO? So um, I, I've done a couple of lectures in the last six months to a number of different universities to, to graduating seniors, basically with that same question, maybe even more broad. They're like, well, how do we, how do we future proof our career? We had COVID now, there'll be something new next year or something new following that. There's always gonna be change and challenges in front of us. Some of it may be digitally induced, some of it may be uh, you know, healthcare induced or whatever pandemics. We, there's a, the world is constantly changing. I believe there are three skills that everybody needs to learn. When I teach my class, my class focuses on every one of my students, whether they're a data scientist, an MBA student, a software engineer, we work on these three skills. Skill number one, analytics. You, you need to know what you can do with analytics. And you don't necessarily need to go know how to, how to code a TensorFlow or a neural network, but by golly, you better understand how it works and what you can do with it, right? So you need to understand what are the things that I can do using reinforcement learning, using unsupervised or supervised machine learning? What are the things that these things do? So a, an understanding of the application of advanced analytics is critical for everybody, whether you're a nurse, a lawyer, a barista, a tech, whatever you might believe, be, you need to understand that. That's number one. Number two, you need to understand economics. You need to understand where and how value is created. Right? You need to understand how value is created with customers, how it's created with the operations, within markets, within products. You need to have a solid foundation, not in finance as much as in economics, and understanding a lot of the basic economic concepts, you know, uh, economic multiplier effect and postponement theory and all these and supply and, you know, supply and demand, a lot of basic concepts come to bear in the area of, of um, around economics. And then the third mix in, so you don't do these separately, mix these all together. The third one is design thinking, which is learning to speak the language of the customer. And the single most important tool that I think everybody should learn from design thinking is how to create a customer journey map. Think about your customer. Think about where they go through the path that they take from the minute they have an epiphany that they want to do something all the way through the afterglow. And then identify all the decisions that user has to make to, to support that journey. And identify in that journey, which are the points of high value or value creation, right? Around which I wanna make sure I'm monetizing. And what are also the points of the, that, you know, value destruction, the hindrances, because you might find that those, those points of hindrance, hindrance, of hindrance are also monetization opportunities. And so what you do is you, you really have to learn what a customer is because in the end of the day, the only person that provides value 
The only person who provides, who has ink in their pens is their customer. <laughs> yeah. Hey, so uh, I want to learn more. Um, design thinking. Do you have a recommendation for a book or is there a couple of blog posts or anything that we can link? Oh God. Yeah. I, I, I've, I've written a lot about it. Um, I think my, my third book, which is called The Art of Thinking Like a Data Scientist, um, goes into a lot on design thinking with respect to data science. Um, that, that book is, um, I think it's only available on my personal website, deanofbigdata.com. I'll make sure um, to look, uh, link it here. Uh, yeah, well. I'll, I'll send you a link to The reason why I, I self-publish that is I want to be able, see, when you publish, which people don't realize, the minute you publish, you give up distribution and pricing rights. It's not in your control. I, this new book here, I had no say what this price at, right? It was decided by the, and how it's attributed, right? And discounts and all that kind of stuff. I have no say. I wanted a book, a workbook that my students could use that I could have at a price point that any student could afford. And so it's like $9.99. That's $9.99. And I'll say- 900, you know, 900, 900. $999, <laughs> right? My goal here is every time somebody buys that book, that buys me two visits to, uh, to Starbucks. So that's my goal. That's my Starbucks fix. But it's got a chapter in there about the hypothesis development canvas. There's a chapter about design thinking. And it's really the entire workbook is how do you get people to think like a data scientist? Again, regardless of your profession, whether you're going to be a nurse or a doctor or a physician or an engineer or a technician or whatever you're going to be, tomorrow's world is going to require everybody to think like a data scientist. No, I think that's so important and uh, Bill, uh, just a little little information for the audience. Uh, before we were kicking off recording, I told Bill that I was like, hey, I think this is an important topic to talk about uh, uh, just on the value of the business side. And, you know, Bill, Bill just gave, just gave uh, some of the points and m my, my learning through, through, through my career as a software engineer and then, you know, moving, you know, moving more into business development product side. Uh, my journey, my, my journey came because I wasn't the best uh, software engineer, and even even some of the best software engineers, I started realizing on the team, if they couldn't explain to our customer, and your customer, your customer could be, you know, I was, you know, I was a I was a contractor then, but you may not have a customer, you may only do internal products, but you have a customer, and so you know the the the, the things that Bill's talking about here are super important because you're always you're always having to sell and having to communicate your vision. How else are you the projects that you want to work on? You know, um, the only way to continue to get those funded or to get those um, you know sponsored by your leadership or your customers is to be able to show them your vision and and be able to communicate that. So. Bill, I mean, that's, I mean, it's, it, it, I think it's huge to, to our audience and I hope they're still tuned in when they, when they found out we were going to talk business, right? Like, I mean, but that's the point, like this is, I mean, this is, this is important stuff, you know, to be, to be able to understand how to convey these projects. Um, I, so. I, I've, I've, I've had the great fortune of, of having managed a couple of, of data science teams, truly outstanding data science teams. And when I watch their I know what gets them excited. And what gets them excited is when they're talking to a customer, they're able to help the customer solve a really wicked problem using data science. And then that solution gets put into operations. It isn't just having a great idea. It's seen it actually in the works. And that's my teams I've worked with. I've been very fortunate. They, they light up when they know that their ideas are actually helping, you know, help this company do this more, you know, more efficiently and better. So again, you, you to be effective, it is not just about having great ideas. It's about being able to put those great ideas into work and provide value to people. That's, at least for me and for the people I've associated with, that's where it gets fun. So part of our audience as well too, you know, we do, we, we, we do have folks that are, you know, executives or leaders or, you know, um, directors uh, within their organization. Executive, so say, get off your ass, <laughs> get off your ass then. <laughs> so let's say, yeah, well, I mean, that's where we're going with this question. So say they're watching this and they're like, Hey, I, I like Bill's excellent venture. I don't think my company is one of the, one of the handfuls that are doing it right. What are the steps that I can put in place um, to, to start attracting talent? Let's just start with the talent portion. How, what, Great data. We want to start building a great data team. How do I attract that talent? Great talent comes to organizations that empowers them. Great talent wants to be at the front lines, providing value 
and don't want to sit in a box, but want to be a part of a team that's creating swirls. I, I call it um, organizational improvisation. And what I mean by that, Thomas, is that people want to work in a situation where all of their skills are being tested and pushed. They want to be in a like a great soccer team, right? Think about the women's U.S. women's Olympic soccer team, right? Poetry, ballet on the field, working in combination. Was there a coach above them yelling, you know, Susie, move here, Janet, go here, right? No, no. They had been empowered as a team and as individuals to accomplish their objectives, and that's what they did. And so I think what it all starts with empowerment. I have a I have a little thing when I finish my 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 video blogs in the morning. I always end up by saying hashtag culture of empowerment yields hashtag culture of innovation. When you can empower people, when you can allow people to try things, test things, fail, learn, and try again, you will get the best people. And better than that, you will get the best out of your people when you let them do what they can do. Again, this idea of I'm, I'm very much against the, the organizational box where you take somebody who's really brilliant, we stick them in a box, we put them in that cage and they're never let out. Bullshit, right? People are brilliant. They can learn, they can synergize, they can blend. They can, they can take one plus one and equal three and seven. You can take diverse perspectives and diverse opinions and you come up with something even better and more powerful that friction is how tires move, right? It's all these things. But yet we, his senior management wants to go out and hire a, a data engineer and put him in a data engineer box. My golly, no, right? You think about a data science team, you got data scientists, you got data engineers, you got an ML engineer, you've got business subject matter experts. My team always has a design thinker amongst it. You have this team. And here's the beauty of a team. Everybody at some point in time will be forced to have to lead. Everybody takes turns leading, depending on the task at hand, right? Everybody has to be prepared to lead. Everybody has to be prepared to work together. You're, you know, it's it's like playing, it's like playing a Game Boy. <laughs> I had it's from my childhood. <laughs> yeah, it's like playing a Game Boy, right? And and when you play uh, Final Fantasy Legend 2, you soon realize that the way to win the game is to have a very diverse set of characters who each will take different turns leading at different points in the game. That's the way teams work. So senior executives, if you want to get the most, I mean, you're talking about hiring the best people. You probably have some pretty damn good people already in the company. You just have never empowered them. You've never given them the ability to try things. And by the way, if you don't fail enough, you never learn enough. If we believe the economies of learning are more powerful than the economies of scale, then you have to let people fail. Just, you know, you can't fail stupidly and you have to learn from those fails. That's how you learn. You try things out. You, you, you nurture that natural curiosity to see, well, what happens if I blend this data set with this data set using these sort of ML AI frameworks? <laughs> Blows up. All right, well, that didn't work very well. Document, share that, try something different. That's how yeah. we learn. I, I used to, so one of uh, one of my early managers in my career, and I, I love this saying in, in, in the way he kind of treated it because he said that, hey, I, I'll only be mad at you as long as you, you know, you no, no mistake or no making a decision, as long as you don't make a decision that a, that a first grader could, could make. I, <laughs> I, I think I just blew the saying, but I knew what he was trying to say, right? Like, as long as it wasn't, like you said, just something, 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 something you could prevent or something that, you know, didn't put a lot of thought. So, well, here's the interesting part of this, Thomas. So I, I believe that greatness is in everyone, but every now and then you'll have people who aren't ready to step up towards that. Yeah. I, I've, I had, I had, a, I had a really powerful data scientist, really, really smart, just could not step up, I had to let him go. It wasn't the right fit for him. He was struggling. He was not happy. He was bringing the team down he had to be let go. And he came, he went and found another great job somewhere else that he could sit into a box and do what he wanted to do. He did. He wanted to be in the box. He didn't want to be in this world. He yeah. wasn't ready. He didn't want to lead. But I tell you, I, I believe that greatness is in everyone and it's up to management to basically un, unleash that greatness, to let the best come up. And by the best managers out there, if you, all your, all your people are doing great things, suddenly you look like a genius as a manager when yeah. all that you've done is you basically have unleash that greatness in your people. 
Yeah, no, so I, I, I like where we're going here. So I want to continue on this path. So um, for that director, for, you know, like I said, maybe we've got some executives to watch. I've gotten, I've gotten a few uh, interesting questions mm -hmm. and emails. So we know how to attract that a talent and they're on board. We're, 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 we're doing the right things. We're empowering. We're making sure that we have um, diverse thoughts and, and leadership uh, with, with, within our team. Everybody's stepping in the lead. How do I manage that up, right? How do I, maybe, maybe this person is the, did you say the mini, the mini CIO or the mini, yeah, mini, mini CIO, CIO. Yeah. If, if we're stuck there, how do I make that, how do I, how do I manage up to get that cultural change so that once again, the goal is to become that handful of companies, right? So the, the key is to find a friendly on the business side. That is somebody on the business side um, who's trying, who's in one of two modes. And I, when I was in sales, um, I was a big fan of the Miller Heinemann selling technique. And um, he used to say that there, the people in two modes are the people you want to sell to people who are in growth mode and people who are in trouble mode, people who are in growth mode, know there's something bigger they can do. They just need help to get there. People are in trouble mode are people who know they're in trouble, know if they don't switch things around, they're soon going to be out on their tail. I like both those kind of people because they're now open to suggestion and trying to do things differently. And so you find a friendly, hopefully probably somebody more in the growth mode, somebody who's, you know, I had a situation with a chief marketing officer and he branded to the company, wanted to put his fingerprint on the company. We were releasing a brand new product. Um, he wanted to, we had, you know, how do you focus your scarce sales and marketing resources to around the right customers for that product, right? So we worked with him and it's in his marketing team and the brilliant CIO we had, we put together a plan and we, we launched this and the first year it generated an additional 28 million in revenue, right? Think about that, 28 million in revenue from one use case. 28 million, it's like, that's like found money. It's like walking on the street and stumbling on a bag of money and go, oh, here's $28 million for you, right? I've never found that on the street. <laughs> <laughs> if I had, I wouldn't be talking to you. I'd be saying that's violent, but that's, but that's what it's like, right? So you find a friendly who has a vision and you help them, you make them a hero, right? You make them the champion. And then they're out telling the rest of the, C, the CXO that, yeah, I just ran this UK case and uh, I've got, this my first one. He got 13 more to do. The first one yielded $28 million in additional revenue. And you'll watch all the draw jaws in the, in the executive and go, what would yeah. you guys do? Right. Then what happens is, of course, success breeds success, which is interesting. So first off, find a friendly, make them a hero, make sure they've got a problem that's big enough. Right. I, I love the company to say, well, is my is my data big enough for big data? No, that's, a, that's the wrong question. Is your problem big enough? Right. So twenty eight million dollars. Once you've done that and you've started to convince the organization, you know, person by person, you this value. The next biggest challenge you're going to have is on governance to make certain you've got a process put in place so people are are, are running their ideas through you. Because what you don't want to do is have somebody go, well, I'm, you know, I can't wait for your team to get to me. I'm going to hire my own team and do my own thing. Well, data silos, right? Kills the value of data. Orphaned analytics. I can't, I can't continuously learn and adapt if I have orphaned analytics. So you have to have a rigid governance organization, which means this chief data monetization officer. Not only are they a collaborative trying to step across borders and make shit happen, but they also got teeth and they're not afraid to be a son of a bitch to walk across and say, no, we're not going to have these bands of random data scientists in the organization. And they're going to sit in our organization. You're going to work it through our governance process because whatever you learn from the project you just did, we want to make sure that every other part of the organization learns because the economies of learning are more powerful than economies of scale. So the chief data monetization officer needs to be on one hand, very friendly, has the carrot, can make you more money. Here's $28 million per UK case, but it's got a big old stick with a nail in it saying, if you don't play by the rules, buddy, you're out of here. Yeah. So I, I, hadn't, I hadn't seen it from a governance perspective like that. So, you know, building that value, I mean, and essentially what in, in my head, the way that I'm kind of walking through it is, all right, so I build this amazing team um, and we start, you know, we, we, we find a friendly and essentially you're building your brand internally until, you know, you have, you just have this rush of so many different opportunities within your organization. And then I guess I, I'd never thought about it from the perspective of organizations start to fall down when, 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 when they start building their own 
hey, you can't have four four centers of AI excellence, right? I know, right, right. We we saw this problem in data warehousing, right? We start off with data warehousing, but data warehouse was really hard to build. They were really hard to build, so businesses couldn't afford to wait for the data warehouse to get to them. So they built their own data marts, and so you had this proliferation of data marts. And then what happened? is you'd have people walk into a meeting, the VP of sales, the VP of marketing and the, and the chief financial officer, and they'd all lay their reports on the table Yeah, and their sales numbers were all different. It still happens. <laughs> yeah, it still happens. And so immediately all the credibility of the CIO, all the credibility of the chief data monetization officer, everything they've done has been destroyed because the three reports don't match. So yeah. you cannot, if, if we believe that like oil, was the economic catalyst for growth in the 20th century. If we believe that data is that catalyst for economic growth in the 21st century, then we have to treat it properly. We have to give it the right governance process, not around data governance, but around data monetization governance. So we're making sure that we're reusing these assets that can be used over and over again, that we're knocking down the data silos and we're putting our hands around and choking out all the orphaned analytics that are out there. No, so you've, you've reminded me of something, and this was early in my career, and now I understand why. So um, <clears throat> I worked for, uh, I, I was a contractor, I did some projects, and, um, you know, it was government, it was a government thing. So, uh, you know, it, sometimes there's inefficiencies there, I've heard. Uh, so. A little bit, a little bit. <laughs> But um, we used to have we used to have a project, and I, you know, we, there's all these boards of boards, and you get to sit on a board, and you you, you feel special, especially when you're brand new out of college. Um, but we used to we used to have to have authoritative data source boards because we didn't know what my database called something was the same as the you know a, a different database, and then it's like I mean we had meetings on meetings on meetings on just just, just so that our applications could talk. We were just trying to build APIs. I mean, and like I said, this was a this was a while ago. This is hey folks, if if you've been following uh, some of my stories, this is back when I was a web developer. This is before I really uh, got into uh, the data space and started doing Hadoop. But this is back when I was doing some .NET. But we were trying to build APIs, and the problem was is like you said all of us all of us would come in with our our report and say hey we say you know we say that you have five widgets and you say that we have six widgets and you you don't even call it a widget <laughs> exactly we used to always joke that the hardest question to ask was what were sales last year to ge and you'd watch people scramble for one thing what do you mean by sales? Is that dead net or is that gross or right? Yeah, is that, right? Is that, margin. Yeah. What do you mean by sales? And then GE is that GE proper? Is that all their subdivisions? Or I mean, so we 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 see that it immediately fall apart. We'd ask that one question, and we knew we'd laugh because we knew that it would send the company off in a tizzy for for weeks and coming back with number and and they'd come back with different numbers because no one had the common definition. So here's a here's a point here, governance only works if governance has teeth, right? If you governance can't enforce, governance will never work. If governance is something that we do kind of nice, we play together, it, it doesn't work. It has to have both the carrot and the stick. It has to have that, sorry, that punishment aspect that if you don't play by the rules, then you can't have access to the data. Yeah. Well, man, I think we've got a ton here. I want to switch to a couple <laughs> things that I, I have on my list just for me personally. Um, so, sure. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty interested in these. So hopefully, so um, Bill, you know, I know we've worked together for, 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 for many years. I followed you, um, you know, I, just the amount of content that you push out, um, publishing books, it's something that I've never done. Like, so one, how often, how often do you write? Is it like a daily thing for you? Or, or when, you, when, it, when it's time to write a book, do you say, hey, I'm going to sit down and I got a thousand words or I'm going to sit down for an hour today? Or is it just, I, I, I know when we used to do this thing called business travel, I know that that's when you were banging out those blog posts, right? So I, I know you and I have had this conversation before. So, you know, you've, you've given me tips about, you know, how to continue writing and, and moving in my career, but help the audience out. What's, what's kind of your process for writing now? Um, Inspiration gets me to write. And when I'm working with customers or students, even now on social media, I find conversations there um, can inspire me to, to write something. Um, somebody will ask me a question. They'll point out something. I'll write a blog and they'll add something to it. 
And I'll realize, wow, that's, that's really good. That what you added just made my point much stronger. And so I, I look for inspiration by engaging with people. Um, again, it's either, you know, my, in, in my book, nothing in my book didn't happen, but with a customer, right? My customers have always been my best teachers. And I've always tried to go in with, you know, one mouth and two ears, really try to understand. I really sincerely want to make my customers successful. And I've been very fortunate in most every job I've gone to, I have brought customers with me because they like the way that I approach things. And I, when I change jobs, they come with me and, I, and I'm going to land somewhere else and I'm going to bring some customers with me because they, they, like that, they like that kind of engagement where you can be transparent and working for each other's benefit. So it's, it's motivation that does it. Um, and so I get a topic. Some of, some of my blogs, I can write them in a day. Some of them literally take months. I've got a topic. I know it's important. I just can't make it work and I'll write it and I won't like it. So I'll put it away for a week or two and I'll come back to it. And sometimes it just doesn't take, but it's motivation. But I will tell you this. If you get the book, read the first paragraph of the preface, right? This book flew out of my hands. I just, it just came together because what was going on in the country when I wrote this, and this this was probably started in May, June timeframe. It really hit me. What was going on in our country so infuriated me that I wrote this preface and that became the driving force for the book. And so sometimes something motivates you so much that you can't stop writing about it. And so how do, I don't have a, a plan schedule. I will try to push things out. I'm not afraid to take an idea that's half-baked and throw it out there and let people sort of noodle on it and get yeah. help me make it better. I, I am clearly never the smartest person in the room, but my job is to be, mo to be the, my goal to be the most provocative person in the room, to push people and try to help them to come up with ideas because their ideas will make me smarter. Yeah. So following up on, on, on that, um, Interaction, customer interaction, you know, student interaction, just, you know, being able, being able to kind of have those debates and push people great, you know, uh, big ways to learn, but other, um, other, other sources that you would recommend that we should follow? Like, are there people, are there people that, you, that you're like, you know what, I'd, anything that they publish, I'd, I'd read or, you know, is there certain, certain books? Oh, yeah, there's, I mean, there, if, if you follow me on Twitter, um, there's a, a fair number of people who always, they post, I, I'm a big fan of Twitter. But then again, understand, I only stay in my swim lane. I don't go to the crazy, you know, conspiracy theory sites. I stay off the main, main Twitter feed. Um, I stay on hashtag data science. I stay in hashtag big data. So someone like Kirk Bourne, for example. Kirk Bourne, who wrote, by the way, wrote the foreword for my book. Um, he's brilliant. Um, Ronald Van Loon, Bob Hayes. There's, you'll start... Um, Antonio Grasso, and there's all these people out there, and some of them I've never ever met. I've only on social media, but they they publish things. They're always pretty good. So I would say, you know, follow me, and then follow the people who start tagging me, and you'll start seeing just tons of great stuff. Um, very little political stuff happens. It just you know people block that stuff when you're on that track. You're taking talking data science. No one cares about politics, right? That's all make believe stuff anyway. So, and you know, data science is real, right? So I, I and I also think LinkedIn's the same way. I, I'm another yeah. big fan of LinkedIn. I think I'm big on LinkedIn right now too. I, I, there's great conversations. Yeah. And the, the beauty of LinkedIn is you can have long posts. Mm -hmm. That's also the, the harm of, link, link, of LinkedIn is people can, can write things. And what I like about I'm Twitter- I'm guilty, I'm guilty a little bit, sorry. <laughs> yeah, Twitter, you gotta, be, you gotta be right to the point. You gotta have a, a cue. A, yeah. So if you have a good mix between Twitter and LinkedIn, I think you're you're going to learn a ton about again follow hashtag data science hashtag big data hashtag design thinking. There's all kinds of great sources out there. People who are posting great stuff. There's a lot of brilliant people out there in hashtag design thinking. So th it's easy to learn. There's a, there's a plethora of great content out there, but most importantly, there's an opportunity to build community and have conversation. Community, community. I, that's I that's that. the beauty of it. That's that's social media at its best. 
Yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, I'm I'm glad you brought it up. That hey, you know, there's there, there's these there's these folks out there and these experts, and some of them some of them I've met and some of them I haven't. Um, here recently, um, I actually and I'm gonna keep making these jokes about uh, virtual events until we have regular events. So just you have to bear with me. But um, I, I I I met Bernard Mar. Uh, so we 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 actually did a Zoom session. So uh, I was was pretty excited, you know, just to see folks in the industry and and to meet. So uh, I. I love hearing you say that because, you know, you know, like I said, I, I still feel like, I guess I've been in the industry a while, but I, I still feel like I'm, I'm, I'm continuing to learn. So hearing, hearing from you that, Hey, there's still folks out there that I'm, that I'm actively engaged, engaged with and following, and I haven't met them yet too. So it, yeah. it, it, it makes me feel good. So I yeah. So and <laughs> it, it, it's all about community. Bernard Mars, another good one, like you said, and I, yeah. Doug Laney, another brilliant person out there, right? John Thompson. And there's, there's just a plethora of really smart yeah. people. Some of them have a, sort of a broad perspective. Some of them have mm -hmm. very, you know, detailed in certain areas and they both work. Yeah. All right. So I got two more questions, man, and we'll wrap it up. I know uh, uh, okay. this is, this is just, this is just awesome, man. I could continue. Um, so <clears throat> I always like to get this because some of this just helps me like plan my career. So everybody else, if you're still watching after, I don't know how many minutes we're in, <laughs> but um, so uh, two to five years, what's next for, you know, what's next for the analytics market, AI market, like, like wh where are we, where, where are we going to be? What, what are some of the things that we're going to be doing and concepts we're going to be talking about? I think we're going to continue to see a lot of the technical aspects of data engineering and data science become more automated, driven by techno. Auto ML is going to change a lot of what goes on. Um, one could argue that for the that maybe a data scientist is not the right career to have um, because technology advancements may make that you know not a very attractive role. Um, so I think we're going to continue to see advancements in auto ML and, and, and meta learning and active learning and all these other types of techniques that are out there that are going to, um, make the data scientist role, maybe, um, less valuable. I think you're still, but you, but it'll never be less valuable for setting up the problem, right? You've always got to have a really good firm understanding of, identifying, codifying, operationalizing, and learning the source of the value. So, um, so that's to me is number one. I think the, the job of data engineer, on the other hand, I think is gonna to become to grow. Um, we have, we have <laughs> data engineer, you know, we haven't cracked the code on making that job any easier. No. It's still very hard. It's still manual. We haven't stopped ETL yet. <laughs> I know, and we, you know, and we probably won't because it's just, there's, there's all these, the data engineering job is hard because data is dirty and data is difficult, right? And, and it's, so data engineering is a good job, the career to have. It's, it's underappreciated. It's clear, right? Data scientists are the sexiest job in the world and the data engineer, what, were they chop suey? I mean, come and, on. And, and this is one thing, this, this, this is the dirty little secret they won't tell you. No, this is the secret that people are saying. And, and I, I am seeing people talk about it on Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, the pay scale now for data engineering, and it depends on which site you're looking at, uh, data engineers now, uh, their salary average uh, on, on, on some places are tracking higher than data science. Yeah. So that's, that's, yeah, we're that's, making a lot of advancements in, you know, these, these deep learning routines and reinforcement learning techniques and such. A lot of these are um, learning on their own. I mean, think about, you know, what is, what does deep learning mean to software development? I mean, you're, we're, we're entering an age where software 2.0 may be written by ML AI models and not by coders. Because imagine trying to write a code that can distinguish between a cat and a dog. Uh, it ain't gonna happen, right? And, and neural network, piece of cake. It figures it out and it can tell you right away, right? So there's the, 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 the AL and AI and ML models are going to um, continue to get more and more advanced, more and more capable. The data is going to continue to get more broad, more dirty, more diverse. Um, you know, right now we're all fatuated with IoT data. God, that's a mess. If there ever was a mess of a data source, it's <laughs> IoT data, right? These these devices were never designed to share data, and so getting data from three or four different devices from different little operating systems. Oh God, it just data engineering is a good good career path. <laughs> yeah. I, I, 
audience, I didn't even, I, I, I didn't pay him to say that. I didn't, we didn't, it was not in our show notes. Uh, <laughs> that's awesome. I, I, I'm actually going to break this out and make a little clip out of, out of this. There you go. Music. Um, so, all right, Bill, um, man, thanks. You've been super generous with your time. Uh, where can folks get in touch with you? How do you, how do you want them to interact with you? Yeah, come on social media. Um, LinkedIn, if you want to have a conversation with me, LinkedIn is the best place. I, I, I usually do track the messages I get there. Um, Twitter is a little bit harder to track messages, um, but I, um, I post, I post in both Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, but LinkedIn's a place to find me. I hang, I'm hanging around LinkedIn. I got my, my, got my Starbucks and I got a burger or something. I'm kind of hanging around there. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm bullish on uh, LinkedIn. I think, uh, I think it's a platform that, that's, I think there's a lot of upside there. Um, as soon as I figure out how to do video there, uh, I think that's, uh, <laughs> that's, yeah. that, that may be, that may be an area uh, for, for me to visit. Well, Bill, thanks again um, for, for, for joining in today, man. Thanks, Thomas. And, and by the way, if you get the book, right, if you get the book, I, I've got questions. I, everybody, I, I, if you get the book and read it, there's three questions I want to know. Number one, what about the book did you find most valuable to you personally? Number two, which topics in the book needed more depth? And number three, what topics did I miss? So everybody gets the book. If you will do me a favor and send me the information, because I'm always looking for new topics. And if you like the book, please, I feel like an Uber driver here. Give me a five-star rating on Amazon, right? Because <laughs> it does help to, it helps promote it that way. But I really want those three questions. What did you find most valuable in the book? What did you find the book needed to provide more detail on? And what did I miss entirely? Because who knows, I might have one more or two more books in me before I before I kick off. Well, thanks again, Bill.